Welcome. Thank you for joining us for another program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. Our speaker, Ted Hurt, begins a series of programs which we will broadcast throughout the spring about the civilians of Gettysburg during, before, and after the Battle of Gettysburg. Ted begins our series by looking at two teenage boys who witnessed the battle and who were here for the Gettysburg Address by President Lincoln. Ted Hurt is a lawyer by profession. He divides his time between Gettysburg and Washington, D.C. In Washington, Ted is an adjunct professor at the George Washington University School of Law, and he also works with the District Court of Appeals. In Gettysburg, he serves on the Adams County Historical Society's board, committees, and is a licensed town guide. It is in his capacity as a licensed town guide that he's speaking to us this evening. So Ted, I'm gonna turn the program over to you by asking you, how did you find the time and the interest to become a town guide? How I became a town guide is uh, an interesting story. Uh, I believe I've always been interested in Gettysburg, uh, probably uh, visited there in the 1950s, uh, but I knew nothing about the town. When my wife and I uh, decided to retire to Gettysburg, uh, we found an historic house right on Baltimore Street uh, that was built in about 1817. Uh, and our next door neighbors uh, are town guides, so they interested me in joining the group. And I, I, uh, I've always loved local history and uh, to learn about the town uh, and the civilians and, and indeed the, the people who lived on my block in 1863 uh, became very fascinating topic for me. And over time, I've learned a lot about, uh, about the town and the civilians and their experiences uh, before, during, and after the battle. And uh, so uh, as, as a, a very interesting uh, avocation, I'm one of 12 town guides, and uh, we give tours uh, of the town, a basic tour, and we have specialty tours. Uh, some focus on the battle, some are focused ex almost exclusively on the civilians. Uh, so it keeps me learning more about the town and the, and the streets that I pass by every single day. Hello, my name is Ted Hurt, and I'm, I'm happy to give a presentation today entitled Two Young Men in Gettysburg, 1863, Daniel Skelly and Albertus McCreary. Many of you know from reading about the battle that the Union and Confederate forces traveled and fought through the town, but many people do not know about the experiences of the civilians who witnessed the battle, uh, either from their cellars or uh, from afar, as the battle raged around them. For this program, I think it's important that we look at the battle from the standpoint of civilians who were able to watch the battle and have the perspectives of these two young men. Both of these young fellows were teenagers, uh, ages 15 and about 18. Each of them saw the beginning of the battle. They witnessed the occupation by the Confederates. They later had the opportunity to watch Lincoln deliver his famous Gettysburg Address. It is important to see the battle and its effect on the town through the eyes of the civilians, and these two young men could bring their own perspectives and experiences to their accounts. We have many uh, accounts by civilians of the battle and its aftermath. Uh, we are fortunate that both Skelly and McCreary wrote very detailed accounts uh, of their experiences uh, after the war. We first will discuss Daniel Skelly, a young man who uh, did his account in 1932. And you see him as a young man, basically at the time of the Civil War. And this is the, this is the account as a paperback pamphlet. The second young man we're going to discuss is Albertus McCreary. And his account is written again decades later, uh, actually in 1909. It appeared in a well-known magazine called McClure's. We do not have a photo 
of the young Albertus McCreary. So we can only imagine what he looked like. And uh, this is a, a recent painting of Albertus by a well-known uh, Civil War artist, David Geister. Uh, this original is at the Children's Museum at the Rupp House. Briefly talking about the Skelly family, it's a very interesting family. A father, Johnston Hastings Skelly Sr., lived in the town and had a number of children. He was a tailor in town, and you can see an old advertisement from 1852 that indicates his profession. It will be no surprise to us that his son Daniel uh, picks up on that same type of profession. And you can see that Johnston Skelly is looking for an apprentice uh, to help him in the tailoring business. We really pick up the Daniel Skelly story uh, when he becomes a clerk at the Fonestock store, which many of you are familiar with on South Baltimore Street. This is, I believe, an 1833 painting showing a militia marching up the street and the building to the right of the flag is the Fonestock store. At the time of this painting, it was, I believe, a tavern. When we turn closer to the time of the Civil War, we see the Fonestock brothers uh, operating the store in this 1852 excerpt from the famous Adams County map. Uh, this was probably the largest retail establishment uh, in the borough, a uh, dry goods store. Uh, we will see in a blur uh, in this illustration at the very back upper left corner what looks like a square. It's an observation tower, and we'll talk about that because it's important to the battle. We learn about Daniel Skelly as an individual at the beginning of the Civil War when there is a militia unit uh, formed called the National Cadets. Uh, he's actually identified in the newspaper as the captain of the group. And the, uh, the newspapers at the time report that the cadets are healthy and athletic with scarcely any perceptible difference in size. A number of these young men later will join the regular army, although uh, Daniel Skelly uh, does not do so to my knowledge. We often think of a different Skelly when we're uh, looking at local history. His brother, older brother is Johnston, uh, Jack Skelly Jr., and those of you who know uh, our local history know that uh, that Skelly is uh, related in some way as a friend or perhaps as a romantic partner to the famous Jenny Wade, the only uh, civilian killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. And of course, there are many uh, books and other articles about their relationship and whether they were actually engaged to be married. As you may know, he also is tragically killed from wounds after the Second Battle of Winchester. But that's a wholly different story that others will cover. One of the most intriguing and interesting parts of the Skelly story is basically that uh, he is accepted at West Point in New York. And uh, there's just a little blurb in the newspaper basically saying that he's been appointed a cadet. Uh, he was sponsored by uh, the local congressman, Edward McPherson. And we do know that he traveled up to New York in early 1863, I believe. This is just a, a picture of West Point at the time, of obviously a famous military academy and the launching point for many, many military careers. This is not a photo of, of uh, Daniel Skelly, but this would be a cadet uniform uh, as of that time period. What's interesting is that uh, Daniel Skelly begins his post-war account, uh, basically arriving into the town on the eve of the battle. And he doesn't describe his, uh, his departure point. We believe, based on, I, I will say, reliable source that I've consulted, that he attended West Point only very briefly and probably failed the entrance exam. There is a letter I've seen in, in uh, manuscript type form as of June 1863, uh, so he is there in early June, but by June 29, June 30th, uh, we know he's en route back to Gettysburg. Uh, what's interesting is that he takes, he tries to take the train and he takes the train partway, 
but he can't go further. And uh, he and his friends, uh, they find a hand car. Uh, this is a Civil War era hand car, which of course you have to push uh, with your arms. And eventually, because he cannot go any further, uh, he walks the rest of the way into town to see what all the excitement is about. His narration is very interesting because he is at the focal point of uh, a lot of activity because his house is close by the Fonestock Brothers store. It's on West Middle Street. He actually has the opportunity to see uh, at a distance both General Reynolds to the left and General Buford to the right. And he recalls that uh, General Buford had a calm demeanor and a soldierly appearance. Uh, and that he wore what seemed to be a very unique hunting shirt or coat. Daniel Skelly was a very curious young man, as anyone would be, uh, witnessing a battle to the north of town on, on uh, July 1st. He and a friend walked all the way up into a Union cavalry camp, continued to Seminary Ridge, and uh, with other uh, boys and men from the town, they saw the battle unfolding. Uh, Skelly apparently climbed a tree, but as the artillery shells were flying around the trees, he had the good sense to get down the tree and, and head back into town. It quickened his pace considerably, he stated. We, we talked a little bit only in passing about what I will call the observation deck. How does, how does it happen that we find a high point in town? Uh, now we turn to the famous general uh, Oliver Otis Howard, who takes command. He's coming up Baltimore Street, and he knows the battle is waging north of town. Uh, he's looking for uh, a point of observation. Uh, apparently, he tries to go into the courthouse steeple, I'll call it, or belfry, but it's it's not accessible. And Daniel Skelly is standing close by and uh, apparently gestures the general over, and they go through the Fauna Stock store and up to the observation platform. This is a, a photo now of the building after the battle. Uh, as the caption indicates, it was taken over by the United States Sanitary Commission, a private group that basically came to the relief of soldiers and civilians after battles. And uh, if you look in that upper left corner, you see something that looks like a box, and that is the observation tower that General Howard could observe uh, the battle. This is yet a different picture of, of the uh, scene, not as well, the uh, looks blurred in this photo. So the prior one is the, is the better one. And this one, uh, we actually turn, if we wanted to, to his uh, post-war career. He actually is such an entrepreneur that he eventually, after he is employed by the Fauna Stock Brothers, basically when they close shop, he basically takes it over as a uh, as the entrepreneur, and it becomes, after the war, Skelly and Warner. I would say uh, that if you consult Daniel Skelly's account, uh, you're going to see a, a very vivid firsthand account, including watching Confederate prisoners being escorted out of the town, watching the wounded being brought into houses. He uh, brought buckets of water into one of the uh, hospitals set up at the courthouse. He also observed the Confederates firsthand, said they were under perfect discipline and courteous, and uh, he was able to wander around the town quite quite freely. He claimed that he and his friends slept above the Fauna Stock store and listened to see if they could learn what the Confederates were up to, uh, but apparently the noise was such that they just had to uh, uh, sleep and, and be excited, but not knowing what was going on below them. Uh, he also asserts in his account that he was able to learn about the failure of Pickett's charge, and then, of course, the uh, retreat of the Confederates and welcoming the Union troops into town on July 4th. Picking up on my theme that he was a, an entrepreneur, in his account, he relates that he and a friend borrowed some money from their parents, and they went up to a warehouse north of town and bought plug tobacco. Then they took the tobacco and cut it up into smaller pieces and sold it, uh, to the uh, Union soldiers who were in their camp. So presumably they made some money off of that. Like other citizens, he went into the uh, the battlefield itself afterwards, 
Uh, they saw the ruined trees, the many dead horses, and the various rows of Confederate dead who were uh, assembled for burial. So I'm going to turn a little bit to his post-war career before we talk about Albertus McCreary. As you can see, a headline is that Skelly and Warner are the successors uh, to the Fauna Stock and Skelly Enterprise. I believe the Fauna Stocks uh, ended their business about 1880, 1881. There's another event of importance uh, that many people have uh, recounted, which is soldiers returned to the battlefield, as we well know, and who returned to the battlefield and, and more specifically to the Fauna Stock House, but General Howard. So this is a 1902 photograph of General Howard perched on the edge of the uh, observation tower, as I call it, with, I believe, Daniel Skelly, obviously older now, looking up at the general. So we're going to turn now to uh, Albertus McCreary. Like others in, in our local county, we have a, a vigorous Scots-Irish family. David McCreary is his father. This is a painting of him. He's part of uh, a large family of children. Their house stood at the corner of Baltimore and High Streets, the current location of the Prince of Peace Episcopal Church. Uh, I always um, say to people when I uh, encounter them, tours or, or walking around, that the father must have been fairly well off because it's an impressive looking house and it, op and it occupies a good stretch of land on the corner of Baltimore and High Street. We all know, or many of us know, that Gettysburg before the war was a thriving location for the coach and carriage business. And uh, ironically, here is an ad from 1858 that references a grocery store, but it is a few doors up from David McCreary's saddlery establishment. Again, this is an indication that McCreary is part of this uh, connected industry uh, that makes carriages, coaches, saddles, harnesses, uh, basically, so that uh, the town industry can, uh, can, can prosper. Just as a side note, David McCreary obviously was uh, active in civic affairs. This slide is basically showing that he's one of the sponsors of the new Presbyterian Church for the borough. And Moses McLean, a prominent attorney in town who lived up Baltimore Street, is listed alongside of him. I like to call Albertus McCreary's uh, experiences, his adventures, because in his post-war account, he uh, he basically uh, describes many encounters uh, with the Confederates and, uh, as I say, several close calls for a young man who was curious during the battle. At the very beginning of the battle on July 1st, uh, the Union uh, troops are retreating down Baltimore Street and uh, a young Union drummer boy gives uh, Albertus his drum to hide. Albertus hides it somewhere in the house, and unfortunately his account doesn't tell us what happened to that drum. Once the Confederates take over the McCreary house area, one of the first things they do is they look for Union soldiers who are hiding in the homes or in the alleyways. When the uh, Union officers had come through on retreat. They urged every family to go into their cellars to avoid uh, crossfire. And uh, David McCreary takes all of his children down into the cellar, and they actually leave their supper, their noontime meal, uh, ready uh, to be set and eaten. There's an interruption because the Confederates come into the cellar looking for wounded soldiers or soldiers who are hiding from capture. And Mr. McCreary can say with a straight face that there are no Union soldiers in the cellar. The Confederates logically go up into the uh, upper rooms and they find uh, anywhere between 10 and 19 Union soldiers hiding in all the rooms of the house. And Albertus even says one of the soldiers was hiding under a piano. The Confederates come back and uh, David McCreary uh, invites them for lunch. So the Confederate party is able to sit down for lunch with the um, with the family. Albertus McCreary has time on his hands, and he acknowledges in his post-war account that he started collecting abandoned rifles, and so he would pick up uh, rifles that had been discarded, and he and he hid them in the yard, 
eventually some Confederates came through and uh, they put two and two together, I, I, I will assume. And they asked him, uh, young man, where are these rifles? And he pretends he doesn't know what they're talking about. But uh, eventually he probably sheepishly leads him to his little trove of, of hidden muskets. I'm going to turn a little to the advance to just say that one of the occupations of young men after the battle was relic hunting. And we would think, well, they're hunting for bullets and shells uh, for the tourist industry that will grow up very soon after the battle. Uh, but I learned in studying about Mr. M Mr. McCreary that Albertus and his friends were actually going to, into the battlefield to retrieve bullets and they would uh, collect them and then they would sell them back presumably for reuse so uh, i always say to people this is this is recycling um very early in time before we get to the gettysburg address i'm going to just mention a couple of albertus's other adventures albertus like many other young people would be very curious and his his south windows attic windows looked downhill uh, to the scope of the battle on Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Hill. And those of you who've been in the borough know that Lower Baltimore Street was basically under crossfire by snipers. And of course, Jenny Wade is the uh, most prominent uh, casualty of that type of sharpshooting. But Albertus and his friend would look out one of the attic windows uh, to see what was going on to their south. And supposedly, they moved away from the window at one point, and a bullet grazed uh, the frame uh, where they had just uh, been looking. Albertus also had a what I call a close call. Uh, as I said, he spends a lot of time walking around when things are quiet. The intersection of, of High Street and Baltimore Street are actually a somewhat secluded area where the Confederate occupiers can sit and temporarily relax and probably attend to their weapons and await orders. So Albertus, over time, uh, gets to know a number of the Confederates. He recalls, for example, a Confederate man happily drinking a canteen, uh, water from his canteen, uh, and molasses on moldy bread. And, and told, he told Albertus it was, it was a, a great meal. But Albertus walks around, and at one point in a lull in, in the activity, he finds uh, a Union capper, Kepi. It's not clear whether it was in his family or whether he found it on the ground, but he starts walking around as if he is uh, uh, perhaps a soldier. Several Confederates come up to him and think, well, here's a prisoner of war, and they start marching him off the, off, uh, off the yard, and his dad and the neighbor have to rescue him. So it was a close call for, for Albertus. The slide that now shows the Gettysburg Address is just my opportunity to uh, talk about, again, the firsthand experiences of both gentlemen. As you know, we do not have uh, a, a, a very good photo of Lincoln at the dais, uh, the platform uh, in the cemetery on November 19th. We have a lot of artist renderings. But uh, each of uh, these young men were able to go and, and watch Lincoln deliver his speech. In Skelly's account, he says, I was too young to judge the character of his speech, but what impressed me most was its delivery. The words seemed to come from the soul of the man, from a heart torn by anguish. Albertus McCreary also had the opportunity to see Lincoln deliver the Gettysburg Address. As many of you know, the lead speaker was the orator, Edward Everett, who spoke for approximately one to two hours, depending on the source. So Albertus McCreary says in his post-war account, I waited for Mr. Everett to get through his speech with what patience I could. It was long, I remember. But what he said made no lodgment in my mind. I was only waiting to hear Mr. Lincoln. Last he rose. Only a few really understood the greatness of the words there and then spoken. I've always been proud that I heard them. I'm always fascinated by the careers of uh, civilians after the battle. 
as you probably have learned, Daniel Skelly stayed in the borough as an entrepreneur. He became a store owner and retired and uh, died and is buried in Gettysburg. In contrast, Albertus McCreary, at some point after the war, moved to Washington, D.C. I've been trying to do research on his career there. I haven't had much luck, but uh, from the D.C. History Center, I've been able to find references and directories that uh, McCreary uh, got into the uh, stationery and book selling business and had two different locations in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, where he was involved in that business. And I've seen uh, some examples of his work. At one point in time, he was affiliated with what was then the leading gallery in Washington, D.C., uh, the Veerhoff Gallery. And uh, they were a uh, business not just limited to uh, photography or art, as you can see from this old photo. They were involved in wallpaper, window shades, and, and other uh, activities. Our local newspapers occasionally would cover the McCreary's. Albertus had married a woman who I believe was from Washington, D.C., and they would come back to Gettysburg and travel and visit friends, and that would be in the newspaper. The most fascinating account is that he had a studio uh, at this point in time of restoring oil paintings. As I say, his 1909 account in McClure's is written well after the war. And I would say, just as a general matter, we are all fortunate that people like Albertus did write down their firsthand accounts when they did. Uh, ironically, he died about two years after the publication of this account. And you can see it was one of the lead articles in July of 1909. So that is the end of my program. Uh, I will just say as a, as a mystery that I'm still pursuing that uh, uh, the obituary for, uh, Albert, for McCreary indicates that he was involved in painting and he died of apoplexy at his apartment. So I am still researching that. Thank you very much for listening to my program. Thank you, Ted. Now I have to ask you something about your experiences as a town guide. What is the most fun, the most interesting tour you've ever given? I think that some of the, the most um, interesting tours that I've given are when uh, younger people in particular ask questions about uh, how boys and girls of their age um, lived at the time and what did they do, what did they see? Uh, you can't take for granted uh, electricity or or freely running water. So tales of uh, candlelight uh, uh, nursing uh, and tales of being without any sort of power uh, and having to stock up on food that's in your cellar uh, and your garden has been trampled on by the troops. These are stories that uh, young people who have not seen or heard about that type of experience are learning for the first time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now let's close our program with a salute to the town guides. My thanks to all of you for helping our visitors get the true story of what happened to the civilians here in Gettysburg. Thank you for going out in the heat of summer and in the snows of winter. Here's our closing picture is one of Ted Hurt in the snow this weekend giving a tour. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to all the licensed town guides.